Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome the delegates to the third edition of the DX Summit organized by CII and the Digital and the Center for Digital Transformation. The program is being run on the CII Hive platform as well, where we have more than 4,000 participants who have registered. We have Canada as a partner country for this edition of the summit. A delegation from Canada has joined the various deliberations that we have had for the summit so far. The partnership aims to harness expertise and combine the strengths that exist in Canada and India to supply globally by leveraging digital. We also have a virtual exhibition which has companies from Canada and Indian companies as well showcasing their services in their virtual stalls. In this particular session that we have today on innovative technologies from Canada, we have companies that would be presenting their offerings. We have with us Mr. Bill Tam, Chief Operating Officer, Digital Technology Supercluster. Mr. Colin Singh Dillo, Chief Techni Technical Officer, APMA Tech. Mr. Akash Sharuvela, Engineering Lead Optics and VR Invest, Windsor Essex. Mr. Ed Dawson, Senior Manager, Senior Manager Automobility, Innovation, Simulation Team, Invest, Windsor Essex. Mr. Brian Holmes, Digital Twin Technician, Invest Windsor Essex, Mr. Andreas Waller from Ontario Center of Innovation, Mr. Siavash Kianpour, Research and Strategy, Kepstrom Incorp, Mr. Ed Goffin, Senior Marketing Manager, Pleura Technologies, Mr. AJ Khan, President, Global Syndicate for Mobility Cybersecurity, Mr. Amit Parma, CEO, Brain Toy, Mr. Randy Wallace from the Wallace Group. INC, Mr. Darren Michel, Chief Marketing Officer, Manufacturing Masters, Dr. Thurston Falkner, Director, Ted Canary, Mr. Rod Fair, Chief Revenue Officer, Akimbo Technologies Incorporated. We will now start the various sessions with the recordings that have been sent to us by these companies. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Tam, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Digital Technology Supercluster in Canada. It's my pleasure to introduce our supercluster to all the delegates of the DX Summit. I'm going to just share a screen with my presentation for today. The theme of my talk today is investing in digital transformation. The world has fundamentally changed, and we've seen that increase and accelerate over the last number of years. 70% of new business value over the next decade will be through digitally enabled platforms. 87% of companies say they're either experiencing skill gaps today or expect them within the next few years. Clearly, the pace of the pre-coronavirus world was already fast, and more and more businesses recognize the importance of digital transformation in their undertakings over the next several years. In Canada, we've long recognized that digital technology plays an important role in our economy. Already over 5% of our growth in our gross domestic product is as a result of digital technologies. It accounts for almost a million jobs. We have almost 50,000 companies that work in the sector. We have top tech uh, talent markets in, in uh, North America, in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and Ottawa, some of the biggest cities in Canada. Uh, we have one of the most um, vibrant ecosystems uh, in the Toronto Waterloo Innovation Corridor. And we have investments that uh, have really uh, grown over the last several years, close to 500 investment announcements over the last four years. Our advantage in technology in digital is around some key areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning, quantum computing, genomics, cybersecurity, data visualization, uh, immersive technologies, including what is coming in the metaverse, uh, internet of things and sensors and smart devices, and geospatial and hypo, hyperspectral imaging. And with that advantage, uh, we are one of five superclusters in the country who have received uh, investment dollars from the government of Canada to really pursue excellence in the world of digital. For us, our focus is in three core areas, digital health, natural resources in the environment, and in the industrial segment. 
What we do is accelerate the development and adoption of digital technologies that help Canadian industries, help Canadians stay healthy, address climate change, and also drive economic productivity. This is really about cross-industry collaboration, co-investment, and building the strongest innovation ecosystem that we can here in Canada. It really does represent a new model for innovation. It is about demand-based R&D and collaborative innovation. It's about accelerating the development through co-investment. It's about driving digital adoption through the customer voice. We now have over a thousand organizations across the country that are members of our innovation community, from big companies to leading tech companies, leading academic institutions and research organizations, and also not-for-profit and public stakeholder groups as well. Already we're seeing some tremendous success in our efforts in the three and a half years that we've been in existence. We have uh, invested in over 6,500 learning and development placements to address some of the talent challenges that we see. Uh, we are uh, investing in projects that now are developing more than 150 products and services, specifically around the digital areas I mentioned earlier. We anticipate that this is going to garner over 500 intellectual property assets. Uh, a lot of the investments that we're making are going directly towards small, mid-sized companies, in fact, close to 80% of it. And we expect to be creating over 20,000 new jobs here in Canada based on the 82 projects that we're investing in. Uh, we operate a portfolio that is now over $300 million of investments, uh, almost 200 million of which has come from industry. And as I mentioned before, we have members from coast to coast in Canada is a very large country as, uh, as it is in India. We have projects that um, really focus on a few areas, as I mentioned, one is in health. So some examples of the projects that we're working on in terms of delivering for more accessible, relevant and effective digital health. We have a project in autism sharing initiative, which is really about taking data and making it such that uh, patients will have the ability to uh, use that information both genetically and, and uh, researchers will have access to that information across a broad domain. Wellness AI is a project that we're doing to really garner uh, and utilize artificial intelligence in the support of mental wellness and health. And telewound care is really a um, augmented reality and uh, artificial intelligence technology that replicates what uh, the wounds and provides images so that uh, it really enhances virtual patient care for wound uh, for wound related issues. Uh, we have a number of projects that tie to sustainable approaches to natural resources. We have a project that's tied to uh, detecting illegal fishing in uh, protecting our oceans. We have a project that is really about how we can be better stewards and, and uh, effective remediation of the effects of mining, which is our mining microbiome project. And then we have a project that we are actually working with some of the partners in India around precision crop health and how we can apply digital technologies towards precision farming. In the areas of uh, improving competitiveness of industry, we have projects that tie into the aerospace industry, uh, one of which is around digital aviation records. Uh, we have a project that's tied to the forestry industry, which is about uh, enabling and digitizing the entirety of the forest supply chain. And we have a project around the food delivery and food uh, supply chain is really about scaling that system, both in Canada and abroad. And finally, in the skills area and in the talent development area, we have projects that really provide for a uh, work integrated learning approach. Uh, in our Canadian Tech Talent Accelerator, it is really about providing youth and uh, underrepresented groups with the opportunity to, to seek careers and opportunities in the digital world. We have uh, projects uh, in the Digital Lift project, which is really about enabling and reskilling existing workforces to adapt to the demands of new digital technology for traditional industries. And the Athena project is an example where we are actually trying to uh, build up the capacity for uh, women in underrepresented groups to pursue opportunities in the artificial intelligence arena. Overall, our, our goal as a digital supercluster is to provide a platform for powering the growth and prosperity 
of both Canadian companies and through partnerships with uh, international organizations and uh, partners from India, we hope that we can actually continue to build on the momentum we've seen in improving the health and well-being of not only Canadians, but peoples around the world, driving sustainability and adapting to the uh, impacts of climate change, improving the competitiveness and productivity of industry, and ultimately creating the career opportunities that we know are around the corner for everyone in the world. And with that, I want to thank you very much for uh, your attention this afternoon, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Good day and uh, welcome to um, the DX Summit 2022. My name is Colin Dillon. I am the Chief Technical Officer at the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. And today I will be talking about Project Arrow, implementing digital technologies on a digital vehicle platform. So where did this project start? Well, back in November of 2019 at the throne speech, our prime minister asked Canada, challenged Canada to uh, look at a zero emission future by 2050. Um, our response to this challenge was to develop this project arrow idea in order for us to be able to showcase what Canada's capabilities are as we head for that uh, zero emission future. Well, who is the APMA and what are some of our responsibilities? Well, 95% of all parts that are made here in Canada are made by our members. We have been serving the auto sector here in Canada for over 70 years uh, with over 115,000 employees uh, employed in our sector and uh, parts that the revenue of parts shift is well over 35 billion. And some may say, well, what is the trade association doing uh, working, building a concept vehicle? Well, we have a tradition since 2014 of building concept demonstration vehicles um, using existing platforms. Um, so 2014, 2018 and 2019 were for us the best ways to take existing vehicles and to demonstrate te technology, both software and hardware. But the challenge obviously is to get into the cans, get into the e ECUs of these vehicles and to build it from the scratch um, for us was going to be a better way to be able to demonstrate even more of what Canada has to offer. And the project is going to be rolled out in four phases. Phase one and phase two have already been completed, the design phase and the extended reality phase. Phase three and phase four are, are underway. We are engineering and building the vehicle uh, over the next three quarters. And in 2023, we will be starting a North American tour showcasing the vehicle at all the major stages. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a view of the current design of the vehicle. Yeah, the design has been frozen. Um, we are very delighted to bring this mid-size SUV and providing all of the lock features uh, and technology that is part of this project. Well, how do we make this come alive? Well, really, it's with over 500 companies registering on our website and then over 55 uh, actually finding their way onto the vehicle. Now, in reality, there's probably over three, 400 components that are coming together here. Um, one company may be supplying several. Uh, some of these companies uh, are probably known globally. Others are what we call small and medium-sized enterprises here in Canada um, from um, provinces like Newfoundland, um, Quebec, um, Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario. A breakdown uh, of the product categories and the companies that are supporting, um, to, again, to provide a highlight of, you know, where we have the support, um, you know, and specifically in areas like um, CAV and VAC, um, we have, uh, you know, a growing number, and I'll explain that a bit more in detail. The vehicle will have level three autonomy uh, brought to us by a Canadian company, Ledartec, uh, globally recognized as one of the leaders in solid state LIDAR, but also a global powerhouse when it comes to autonomous vehicle software and hardware integration. Something new is vehicle as a caregiver, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, we felt 
the best way to um, present a Canadian concept was also to make sure that all occupants are provided caregiving. And we feel with the current existing technologies of facial recognition, biometric sensor, speech analytics, and vital sign monitoring, this was going to be done um, um, with obviously the software in the background providing support. Well, why Canada? Uh, well, we've got a, a, a very rich history in the auto sector. Our assembly plants typically win the JD Power Platinum Award uh, on numerous occasions. Um, we are a global leader in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Our tier ones are some of the best in the world. And it just makes sense that Canada leads the charge on electric vehicle technology and, and engineering. Well, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of DX Summit 2022. Again, my name is Colin Singh Dillon and uh, delighted to support the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada. Hello and welcome to the Invest Windsor Essex VR Cave. My name is Ed Dawson and I'm the Senior Manager of Automobility and Innovation, leading the simulation team here at the VR Cave. I'd like to welcome you today and tell you a little bit more about this amazing piece of technology that I'm standing in front of. The Invest Windsor Essex VR Cave is proud to be supported by the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network to help us bring it to life using some incredible software by our partners at ANSYS Simulation Software. We support here two programs. We support the Connected Autonomous Vehicle Program through the OVIN Network, as well as the Digital Twinning Program that we are partnered with St. Clair College, one of our local academic institutions. Here at the Invest Windsor Essex VR Cave, we are a department of the Invest Windsor Essex team. We are called the Automobility and Innovation Team. And for those who don't know the term automobility, it's really taking the amazing things that we have done in the automotive sector and focusing on the new generation of automotive with taking information technology and bringing it to life. So it's really everything that encompasses the technology that has gone into the automotive sector. With the equipment that we have here on site, we are able to support local companies, international companies, and really help to promote some of the work that we're doing and make it faster for companies working on technology that needs to be integrated and need to be tested using our software capabilities. I'm very excited to introduce a few members of my team. First, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Akash Charavila, and he will be demonstrating one of the amazing projects that you see here behind me the Project Aero Concept Vehicle that we have been proud to work with the APMA, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, to virtually bring to life. So welcome and enjoy the demonstration. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Akash Charavilla. I'm the engineering lead here at Investments at Essex. And I'm here to show, showcase you the, uh, the VR cave and talk more about the projects that we support in, in the VR cave. So what you see behind me is, uh, is, the, uh, is the Canada's largest publicly accessible VR cave uh, dedicated to the research and development of technologies in the connected autonomous vehicle space and also in digital twinning. Uh, what you see behind me is the project arrow vehicle and uh, I'm just gonna dive into the VR cave and give you a brief about what we can do uh, and what we did with the project uh, in the VR cave. So, um, um, Bri uh, Brian, would, could you, would you mind turning off the lights so just so that? Um, okay, so as, as I mentioned, this is the VR cave. Uh, it is a completely immersive, uh, uh, immersive cave where you could be inside the design and experience it in detail in 3D. Unfortunately, because we are streaming over webcam, I had to turn the 3D mode off. But once we, have, once we are in the VR cave with the 3D mode on and I put on these glasses that track my position, uh, I'm able to look at a design with the team collaboratively uh, and look at how the design looks like in perspective, in scale, uh, with, 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 with the Optus technology that runs up our VR cave, we are able to uh, re replicate and uh, re replicate lighting that's that's true to life, 
and look at designs uh, in, in a way that's exactly how it would be in real life. So what, what you see behind is the Project Arrow vehicle. This vehicle was, uh, uh, is a part of um, uh, an initiative by the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, uh, something that Colin just mentioned some time back. And it's, it's a program to showcase the Canadian automotive prowess to the world. And what better way to showcase that than actually building a vehicle. Uh, we helped the APMA team build a virtual model that can help designers look at the design to see how each aspect of the design looks under different lighting conditions, how it is in terms of ergonomics, and how the design uh, uh, looks like in real life. So instead of building a clay model, uh, we could create a digital model that can be experienced in a similar fashion as you would in uh, with, with a clay model. In fact, it's better because I could just walk inside the car and look at it from a driver's perspective. Uh, we have full body tracking inside the VR cave that enables us to uh, even perform ergonomic studies. So I could be in the VR cave wearing some gloves where, with, with which I can interact with the screen, uh, for example, or look at how uh, the, the steering wheel is positioned so that we could have ergonomic evaluations conducted uh, in a digital fashion without the need for any prototyping. I'm just going to zoom in on a few design aspects. With, uh, uh, with, with the VRK, we can also bring in the, uh, features like you know, the wood trim on, on, on the door panels and other. And the software that powers the VR cave is the ANSYS VR experience software. The engine that runs the VR, uh, runs the software, uh, can replicate uh, not only uh, designs, but we could also use that to simulate different sensors uh, that go on, uh, go on an automotive vehicle. It could be a camera, it could be LiDAR, it could be uh, radar sensors as well. And with these, uh, with, with these tools, we can create real life scenarios where you could test your product. So not only can you view your product in, in 3D, but you could test your sensors and simulate uh, their performance in real life conditions. And this is not just limited to, to, a, to a car design. This could, this could be used to replicate how uh, an assembly line would work and how can you conduct layout studies to ensure everything works perfectly fine. And that's exactly what we are planning to showcase uh, in the next segment where uh, my colleague Brian would come in and talk more about the digital twin uh, program and showcase you some demos on that uh, aspect as well. So Brian, uh, off to you. Hi, I'm Brian Holmes and I'm here to tell you a little bit more about the digital twin program here at Invest Windsor Essex. The digital twin program is designed to find solutions to our clients' problems, be those problems uh, an educational, a training, a simulation, or a, a visualization like this one. In the case of a visualization, uh, what you see here behind me is a uh, project that is designed to explore accessibility. Um, the wheelchair on the floor there is designed to move through this space to see if there's enough area for someone who uh, doesn't have the same accessibility. So that's one solution to this problem. Another one was visualization. They wanted to see um, maybe the cabinets needed to be rearranged or maybe the outside uh, texture of this building wasn't what they were looking for. All in all, those were problems that this client had that we were able to solve with this virtual cave. That's not the only solutions that we can find. Um, another client of ours uh, was an industrial area. They, they dealt with recycling and so they wanted to bring their business uh, to, to explain to children and schools and in grade school and high school uh, they wanted to explain to children how their process of recycling worked and so we created a digital twin of their factory because it would be far more dangerous to bring students to that location um, solutions that are simulation in nature uh, or or visualization are all collaborative the set of glasses that you see here which controls where the camera is uh, helps keep things in perspective but we have multiple sets of glasses, and so we can bring groups in to work on a project together. Um, maybe in a situation like this, different people have different ideas about what the walls should look like or what furnishings should be uh, present. And all these things can be done collaboratively rather than with an isolating uh, virtual reality headset. The VR Cave is an exceptional tool for helping us find solutions to problems, and that's exactly what we're here for. Thank you. Hello again. I hope that you enjoyed the demonstrations that we provided you here today at the Invest Windsor Essex VR Cave. 
Just to recap, Invest Windsor Essex is the leading economic development agency here in the Windsor Essex region, located directly across from Detroit, Michigan. We have a number of departments that would be happy to talk to you and assist in any of your interests and inquiries looking at our region and how we can help. And our team specifically here at the VR Cave, as part of the Automobility and Innovation Department, will be happy to connect with you. We will have a virtual booth, so please look for us. On behalf of my colleagues Akash Charavila and Brian Holmes, again, my name is Ed Dawson. we like to thank you for your time and hope that we can connect further. Have a wonderful day. Hello, welcome. My name is Andreas Waller. I'm a business development and commercialization manager for OCI, Ontario Centre of Innovation. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of DX Summit, including the Trade Commissioner Mundargi for inviting us here today to talk about our company. So let's get into it. So today I will give you an overview of Ontario Centre of Innovation. So about, first of all, about OCI. We are a not-for-profit organization and a key partner to government industry and academia, deploying innovation programs and initiatives focused on driving economic outcomes across the province. So what do we do? Let's get to the fundamentals first. Our vision is to be at the center of innovation in Ontario, driving economic growth and job creation through investment in the commercialization and adoption of new technologies. Our mission is to bring industry, academic, and government partners together and invest in collaborative R&D, technology development, and commercialization opportunities that will generate the highest return on innovation for Ontarians. Our mandate is to develop and deliver programs that accelerate the development, commercialization, and adoption of advanced technologies to drive job creation. And we do this uh, by building capacity in emerging and advanced technologies, we strengthen and leverage Ontario's tech sector, and we accelerate commercialization of Made in Ontario IP. Our, we, the business development experts that we have in our company, I'm one of them, uh, we are the boots on the ground. It's a network of business development and commercialization managers deployed across Ontario. So I'm located in Windsor, Ontario, which is in the southwest corner of the province. We are the innovation experts with extensive business. They support companies, large and small, with commercialization and scale up activities. So my background is in automotive, transportation, new, new market development and uh, industry uh, manufacturing. Industry academic, we work closely with regional and sectorial innovation networks, connecting Ontario-based industry to research expertise in Ontario universities, colleges, and research hospitals. So we support high potential projects all across Ontario. As you see on the map here, these are the different projects that we had uh, spread across the province. So over the last five years, OCI has supported projects in over 180 communities across Ontario. The return on innovation. So in the fiscal year of 2019 and 20, OCI invested 360.7 million, including 259.8 million in industry contributions into collaborative R&D and commercialization projects across Ontario and that delivered 6,891 jobs that were created or retained in the SME uh, enterprises and large firms. Uh, there were 693 uh, startup companies that, that were supported, 314 million of incremental sales revenues reported by the st uh, supported startups, and in addition, $834 million in private sector follow-on investment. So here are the different programs that we have uh, from OCI. Uh, these are programs that address different areas of the, of the uh, economy. 
the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network address the, the need to support the development of technologies in mobility that address uh, the, the emergence of uh, autonomous technologies, emergence of electrification of uh, vehicles or uh, other types of, of uh, mobility functions, as well as technologies that are specific to winter uh, conditions. Then we have the Encore 5G, uh, the green one here. And those, uh, that is a platform, uh, there's three platforms or three test beds uh, throughout the province uh, that provide uh, a testing capability for companies to develop uh, the technologies of the future in the on the 5G network. And then we will get to the international soft landing program. I will do a, a separate slide on that, uh, but that is to support uh, foreign direct investment uh, in a soft landing uh, way. The next one, the red one here is the next generation networks program. And this is to help uh, companies uh, size and, and leverage um, large scale uh, deployment of their technologies to make sure that they are ready for it when uh, they grow um, in the market. Uh, the next one is the market readiness uh, co-investment fund, a little bit different than the other ones. Uh, this is a, um, a portfolio of companies that uh, we have uh, invested in. And these are companies that are promising um, scaling companies uh, startup companies uh, that are uh, in the process of, of uh, uh, attracting uh, investment funding, and we do that as a co-investment fund. Um, the last one, but not least, is the voucher for innovation and productivity. Uh, this is the industry uh, academia collaboration program, where we support one-to-one uh, -one fu uh, funding uh, to the industry to work with uh, either university or college or um, a research hospital to uh, solve a technology uh, problem, uh, to develop a new technology, to overcome hurdles in their uh, uh, progress to, to grow their business. So when we go into a little bit deeper on the International Soft Landing Program, uh, this is a collaboration between OCI and Toronto Business Development Center. Uh, this uh, soft landing program uh, is a partnership uh, with TBDC uh, to attract and support international entrepreneurs, startups and scale-ups from India uh, to establish their innovative businesses across Ontario. The goal is to support the economy uh, via increased job creation, regional economic development, foreign direct investment and technological innovation. The project aims to strengthen and augment Ontario's position in the global innovation ecosystem as a jurisdiction of choice for innovative foreign business entrepreneurs seeking to expand their business to Canadian markets. And a lot of this is to make sure that the entrepreneurs that come here, that they know uh, the different areas, the different ecosystems in the different industries uh, that are uh, in Ontario so that we can uh, guide them to the best location uh, possible for them. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the uh, the overview of OCI. And uh, if you need more information, uh, please feel free to contact me at uh, my email address. That's awaller at oc-innovation.ca. And uh, I look forward to uh, perhaps in the future, uh, see you on site in India. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Theo Ash Kampor and I lead research and strategy at Kepster Mink in Toronto, Canada. We're an enterprise software company with a focus on digital transformation amongst various advanced manufacturing sectors. I'm here today to speak about Kepstrom's digital twin evolution. We started in 2005 by generating data-driven life models. We then expanded to the German and Austrian region by 2010 generating physics-based life models. And then we evolved to a digital twin solution to gather our experiences in physics-based life models and data-driven life models to lead industry 4.0. Now we are on the global stage with our digital twin software platform, DSP, allowing engineers to predict their analytics 
verify through test, and validate their predictions in the field. Our target sectors are automotive, aerospace, and industrial, mainly working with tier suppliers and original equipment manufacturers. One of our customers is Johnson Electric, a Hong Kong-based manufacturer of motors, actuators, and other electromechanical components. We are a passionate team of engineers and scientists, simply living on innovation. For any complex product, system, component, subcomponent, we can generate physics-based life models in less than eight weeks and deliver a full digital twin integration in less than 12 weeks. The main engine of Kepstrom's digital twin is our digital specification feature, allowing engineers to transform traditional specification documents, as you can see on the left, into an accurate visualization of the complex functions and multi-stress interactions. For example, simultaneously visualizing a pump's operation in regards to flow, pressure, and temperature, allowing the engineer to understand the component system interaction. Our digital spec then has the capabilities to merge with your existing infrastructure, such as providing the inputs virtually to your test machines or exporting to other analysis methods, such as finite element analysis or model-based design. Digital spec is the missing piece in industry 4.0 digitalization by simply replacing words with functional profiles. Our software then leads to the most advanced prognostics and health management capabilities. For in-production and in-service components, our digital twin solution delivers preventative maintenance and predicts remaining useful life and time to failure. As mentioned before, our models are based on these two sources, physics-based engineering and physical data. The dependency of this model depends on the information available, such as data type, component type, number of components, data availability and accuracy, or physics-based model availability and accuracy. This will ultimately direct your model accordingly. For example, if there's limited data available, rest assured that the model will be heavily dependent on the physics-based predictions. Thank you for your time. My name is Sia Kampur, and you may reach me by email or phone, and please be sure to visit our website. Thanks again, and goodbye. Hello, thanks for joining me. My name is Ed Goffin and I'm the marketing manager with Playera. We've been in business for 20 years and are a leader in interface products for real-time vision applications. Over recent years, we've started applying our networking standards and processing expertise in AI solutions for quality inspection. I'm gonna discuss how new AI tools can improve results and lower costs for visual inspection tasks and show a few examples of where this technology is being used today. When it comes to inspection tasks, we as humans do a pretty good job. We can rely on our senses to detect differences. If something changes, we're adaptable and can make a quick decision on our own. We're also pretty easy to train and we learn by example. In fact, a lot of the research done in machine vision and AI really aims to replicate things humans do really well. The key advantage with technology, it can do it faster, consistently, and over and over without getting tired, bored, or distracted. And with AI, machines can begin to learn so that they can make their own decisions. Despite these machine advantages, there's still a significant requirement for human inspection. For manufacturers specializing in multiple short run, customized, seasonal and regional products, it's often uneconomical to fully automate inspection processes. AI-based visual inspection technology can help add decision support so an operator always makes the right choice. Why do we need these types of tools? Try and count the black dots in this image. We make mistakes, we get tired, and our eyes can be easily tricked. Traditional vision inspection has error rates as high as 30%. Many times what a human inspector identifies as an error is actually a false positive. Error rates are even higher if we're following assembly instructions. New visual inspection systems help guide an operator or inspector through different stages of production including in-process and finished goods. The camera-based small footprint system generally fits into a manufacturing setting without requiring extra space. The system includes pre-packaged plugins for common inspection requirements, image compare and image save. With a very intuitive software tool, 
a quality manager can easily train the prepackaged plugins for their inspection requirements. With just a few good images, often even just one image, the system is trained and ready to use in minutes. For custom requirements, new no-code block-based software platforms let anyone design or train their own quality workflows. Prepackaged plugins make AI inspection easy to deploy. Image Compare is a visual application that makes errors obvious to a human inspector. The plugin is easily trained. All you need is a single image of a known good product. All future products are then compared against this golden master. A manufacturer can have multiple golden masters for different product lines or for regional requirements within those product lines. Image Save lets an operator easily record an image of every inspected product for traceability, batch tracking, or inventory management. AI-based visual inspection systems have been deployed in a range of consumer, food and beverage, parts manufacturing, and print, in, print inspection applications. I'm going to finish my session showing you two examples. Dairy Distillery is a small business operating in a highly competitive global market. For the distillery, one of the keys to their marketing is their unique bottling and eye-catching labeling. You can see here it's a milkshake bottle with three visual brand elements. The main label and cap sticker are both placed by a machine. The third brand element, the round transparent emblem, is placed by a human. The emblem needs to visually align with the other two brand elements. It doesn't sound like too difficult a task, but imagine doing this accurately on thousands of bottles over a shift. The company also has multiple products, seasonal products, and with global shipping now has to consider different labeling requirements depending on the country. It's very easy for an operator to make a mistake. Best case, the company catches mistakes during packaging, but then incurs the cost and time of removing and replacing labels. Worst case, it's not until the product hits the store shelves that the problem is obvious. In a competitive, high value and luxury market, brand plays a huge role in consumer choice. With a poorly labeled product on the shelf, a consumer likely moves on to their next selection. To help solve this problem, the distillery is using AI visual inspection and the image compare plugin. For the distillery, the visual inspection system ensures consistency and accuracy for their valued brand. It saves them time and money if labels have to be removed and reapplied. They can confidently ship products knowing they'll properly represent the brand on the store shelves. The system is easy to train and the quality manager or operator can update the plugin for different products or changing requirements using a single good image. The image compare plugin is trained to identify the key elements of the product branding. In this case, it's the main product label and the cap label. The system then applies an image overlay that guides the operator as they manually place the emblem label. The system can be used during the labeling process, especially for new operators, as they learn where to place the label for different product lines. The distillery is now developing a custom plugin for quality control checks. At the end of production, they're manually inspecting bottles before packaging to ensure brand integrity. This quickly lets them see if the labels are aligned within a certain tolerance with a fast pass or fail assessment. Down the road, the plugin can be used for further inspection on fill levels, cap seal, barcode reading, and more. The second application I'd like to highlight is in electronics assembly. Very similar to the distillery, this customer is a specialized manufacturer with expertise in smaller volume customized manufacturing for the networking, aerospace, and defense markets. They have a very low failure rate and high quality, but are using image compare for products not well suited for fully automated inspection. These are typically products manufactured in smaller volumes with customer unique requirements. With image compare, the visual inspection system provides a second set of eyes for the human inspector to help them find missing and damaged components. We're now working with the company to add dynamic work instructions to the display to help focus the operator on potential issues with each product. The work instructions highlight common areas where there have been issues. As well, the operator can add notes to reports that are generated following inspection of the product production run. The manufacturer also uses the image save function with a snapshot of each product and its barcode saved to their ERP system. They're using this primarily for traceability to ensure good products go out the door. And if there's an issue and a product reaches a customer, they can more quickly get to the source of a problem. In conclusion, ensuring end-to-end -end quality keeps customers happy. It can be the smallest issue that sours a buying experience or makes a consumer move to the next product on the shelf. That's a lot of pressure on manufacturers to get quality right. 
with growing emphasis on customization, seasonality, and regional uniqueness, it could be uneconomical for some manufacturers to consider end-to-end -end automation. Visual inspection systems geared towards quality managers and operators are an easy way to take advantage of new technologies to help ensure quality. With systems that are easier to train and can, can be deployed without disrupting existing processes, manufacturers of any size can take advantage of AI to improve their quality. I'll let Dave Giroux from Dairy Distillery tell you why he trusts AI visual inspection as part of their approach to brand management. For me, I want to make sure that we're getting high quality product out and that we're minimizing downtime and rework. Um, I personally like systems that are simple and easy to use uh, and things that are going to be reliable. This just increases our confidence in our process, uh, which lets me sleep better at night knowing that we're getting a quality product. Learn more at playora.com. Thanks for joining me. You can learn more at our website or send me an email. Hello everyone. My name is AJ Khan and I'm the president of GSMC, the Global Syndicate for Mobility Cybersecurity. GSMC is an independent and impartial non-for-profit global organization Focus on advancing mobility cybersecurity by bringing together all forms of transportation of people and goods through unified security, privacy, and cyber safety transformation. So what do we mean by that? Well, think about it. When you are traveling, when you're going from point A to point B or when goods are moving, what are the cybersecurity challenges in that space? So that is what GSMC focuses on. One of the things which was important for us was that we are headquartered in Canada. And why Canada? Because Canada has a lot of unique advantages. We have trade agreements with so many partnering jurisdictions. We are a global leader in digital te technology. There is a strong focus on cybersecurity innovation and entrepreneurship. And we do have a uh, you know, lot of great uh, leadership happening in cybersecurity education, research and governance. And finally, uh, Canada has a very strong automotive and aerospace manufacturing sector, and we are a global leader in that. So all these combined made uh, it just obvious to have uh, GSMC headquartered in Canada and further the message of enabling mobility cybersecurity across the world what are our mandates? Uh, so GSMC is dedicated to building a safe, secure, and trusted global mobility ecosystem by enabling worldwide collaboration and leadership in cybersecurity. Cyber resilience of the mobility ecosystem is something we really feel needs to be looked at. I live in Windsor, Ontario. So if I take an Uber and go to the airport over here, and from there I take a plane and maybe I come to New Delhi, India, and there maybe I'm uh, going in a train somewhere. So the question is, where is my data going? Who has that data? Is there any privacy issues here? So those challenges and, uh, you know, any jurisdictions uh, you go from, all the global jurisdictions, whether it's Europe, whether it's uh, Middle East, whether it's uh, India, Far East, North America, South America, uh, everywhere you have to look at, where is your data going while you are um, either traveling uh, yourself or if it is about the movement of goods, uh, are they secure? So GSMC is focused on that. To further its objectives in the cyberspace domain, GSMC engages with entities across the world and we work with governments and uh, their agencies, regulators, uh, industry sectors, industry association, think tanks, and our aim here is policy advocacy, thought leadership, capacity building, and outreach activities. We do collaborate uh, to develop standards uh, around technologies in these sectors and countries. We do not develop them ourselves, but we work with various entities who actually enable that standardization. And we do focus on trust building by developing a non-competitive environment. So all the members of GSMC are basically uh, focused on uh, enabling uh, this ecosystem and um, furthering mobility cybersecurity.
these are the sectors which we focus on so uh, automotive marine aerospace ev tolls railways loop tunnel micro mobility mining agri and submerged vessels and we are also even now looking at space because obviously there are cyber security challenges there so if i look at automotive what are the cyber security challenges in connected and autonomous vehicles so obviously there there's a lot of them what if your vehicle is hacked today and uh, uh, your data is stolen or even you know the the vehicle is the control of the vehicle is taken over and that's a health and safety issue so how do you look at that same with aerospace or railway so we look at all these different sectors of mobility cyber security we have uh, you know partners from across the globe uh, these are just uh, some of those countries where, where uh, we have members so mexico um, eu uh, south korea india uk cyber together is out of israel these are uh, uh, countries uh, where um, we have partners and uh, we are actively working with other jurisdictions uh, to further um, this global ecosystem we are looking at these different spaces uh, these are all um, areas where which impact the various sectors of mobility cyber security uh, iot v2x cloud digital infrastructure autonomous uh, mobility edge ids and of course cyber workforce i will not go into details of each one of them um, but basically if you look at the this ecosystem all of those need to be looked at from a cyber security perspective uh, if you are looking at iot what are the challenges with iot um, what about intelligent transportation systems how do you look at them and how do you look at their cyber security uh, we to x vehicle to everything communication so vehicle to cloud vehicle to infrastructure vehicle to device vehicle to pedestrian vehicle to grid electric vehicles what are the cyber security challenges over there edge computing where is your data going and how is it secure uh, obviously the cloud itself how do you secure the cloud uh, autonomous mobility is another huge area where cyber security challenges are uh, something to look at uh, and of course cyber workforce development but here i would like to emphasize there's a difference between the traditional it cyber security workforce and the cyber workforce which we are looking at because mobility cyber security happens in a dynamic ecosystem it is not a single uh, you know server which you are protecting which is in some data center it, you are protecting the vehicle or the aeroplane or the rail train uh, you know you're you're protecting an a dynamic uh, ecosystem with moving uh, components so how do you do that we do publish a number of reports uh, i've mentioned a couple of them over here we had a global uh, mobility uh, stakeholder mapping which we have in progress and we had a report on securing uh, mobility in the skies which is on our website and other reports are coming and are being published so this is uh, what gsmc is about I, I wanted to take this moment and introduce you to GSMC. I encourage you to reach out to me to learn more about GSMC because mobility cybersecurity is critical for our um, uh, um, for the next phase of the connected world we live in. If you think about smart cities, connected vehicles, Industry 4.0, drones, all of those are uh, have cybersecurity challenges, and that is something which we are looking to resolve. And in this regard, we will have our first ever global cyber mobility summit. Uh, in uh, London, UK uh, this October. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please do let me know. Hello, everyone. My name is Amit Verma. I'm a co-founder of a Canadian machine learning company called as BrainToy. I was born in India and now my home is Canada. I had worked in the banking and the outsourcing industry in India, and then in the construction and the technology industry in Canada. It's a pleasure to be here at the CII DX 3.0 Summit. It's like coming home. Well, AI is here. <clears throat> it works, and it's no more a mystery. Companies all over the world use it to reduce cost and increase efficiency. Today, I'm going to show you three instances of how AI was successfully used in Canada and around the world. I'll then share my experiences, what worked and what did not work. And this is to help everyone. So to start, 
let me go to Germany, in which six organizations from Canada and Germany collaborated to apply artificial intelligence to additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing has many applications, from aerospace to mining, but the challenge is that running these machines is expensive. Therefore, they are not used for commodity parts. This had to change. The goal was to make more products, waste less powder. Machine learning was used to auto-tune these machines as an operator's assistant so that the part always comes out right all the time, saving money. But what I learned from this work is that the real value was people. It is very difficult to hire highly skilled people to operate these machines. Some of these people are PhDs. Now AI solved that problem too. The parts always came out right all the time, no matter who used the machine. Now we come back to Canada. Now in this case, a trucking company from Manitoba faced a problem when COVID-19 pandemic started. Uh, the freight pattern suddenly changed because uh, of the COVID-19, it became unpredictable. Quite often, return trips were coming empty for these trucks. The company did not want to lose money by running empty trucks, but they also didn't want to overcharge their customers and lose business. In addition, one of their main priorities was employee welfare. The driver was supposed to come back home to their family every night. Will I come back empty? What may be the right charge? Artificial intelligence was once again used to predict empty miles in this case. Now the dispatcher knew what to quote right at the time of booking a load because they knew if a truck is going to likely come back empty or not. It saved a lot of money for this company. It saved a lot of trouble for the drivers. Now, after Canada, let's go to Argentina and talk about agriculture. This was one of uh, the world's largest tomato producers. Now in agriculture, you know that farmers try to maximize their yield per acre. The problem is that each new plant hybrid had to be tested by growing them in different soil conditions, water and fertilizer schedule. And each such test takes a lot of time and money. What does a farmer do? Now here, machine learning was used to predict the yield of various hybrids by reading prior data. The farmer could now select the best hybrids without doing any physical tests. Uh, this saved a lot of time, energy and money. What was surprising was that machine learning not only correctly predicted the yield, but it also correctly predicted the various sizes of tomatoes. So uh, this, was, uh, this was amazing. So with three use cases uh, uh, which you have seen, you must be thinking, what is the secret? And the key to efficient artificial intelligence deployment is repeatable MLOps. It starts with data, goes to modeling, goes to governance, deployment and monitoring. Now I'm not gonna dive deep into each one of these things because we don't have too much time, but I'll definitely talk about governance. This is one thing that most companies ignore, but it's very, very important. You must have heard the story about Amazon, which built a model which biased against women in recruiting because it was provided the wrong input data and it learned wrong. Now they corrected this mistake after a couple of years of kind of doing it, but it's a fine example of what can happen if model governance is not employed by your company. It is critical to do this for risk, for compliance, and for efficient modeling. Uh, you should ask yourself a few questions. Uh, why is the model predicting what it's predicting? Uh, is there a bias in the model? If I give this model uh, new data, which it has never seen, what will it predict? And these things are very, very important to efficient machine learning operations in any company. So here's a summary of what I learned from all my experience over the last 25 years. One, good talent is very, very rare and people will be your biggest bottleneck. It is very hard to go out and hire, say, 100 good data scientists. There aren't that many available. You'll have people of all skill levels, some who can code, some who can't code, some who are data scientists, some who have expertise in business. And what if uh, one of the people leaves? 
Will they take their code and their knowledge and experience with them? Will you be left behind? Getting an AI platform avoids these issues, immediately boosts productivity. The second, time is the enemy. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying that 85% of the AI projects never actually see production. They just get delayed and delayed and delayed. And I've kind of felt that uh, the moment your project is too big, too uh, large or uh, not well defined, or it takes too much time, that project will likely die a slow death. So my best advice is always take chunk size, bite size projects, uh, give it a less time and do it uh, repeatably. Third thing I've learned is AI brings exponential value. Now I've worked in traditional industries in which, uh, you know, a 40% or 50% return on investment was considered good. Uh, but uh, uh, in AI, we have seen like 400% return. So, uh, you know, if you can know that value upfront and allocate the right resources, you will always do good. Now with that, I will end my presentation. I hope I was able to convey some of my experiences so that you don't re repeat the mistakes that I did. Thank you all. It is a pleasure to be with you. Please visit the BrainProy booth at the Canada Pavilion. I'll be there for the next two days and I look forward to meet you. Hello, my name is Randy Velasquez and I'm the founder and president of the Velasquez Group. I want to first wish you all in India and anybody watching around the world a really warm welcome from Canada. I want to thank also the CII and Tata for uh, allowing me this opportunity and this platform uh, to come to you uh, to speak a little bit about uh, the digitalization uh, of companies and uh, organizations um, and supply chains. Now, when I think of the digitalization uh, of a company, I think of um, everything computer-wise, I think of everything automation, I think of everything uh, paperless, um, but we must also understand that uh, digitalization of companies also incorporates a hands-on approach. And what I mean by that? Well, we need to keep in mind that digitalization is important for the future of our uh, sustainability when it comes to supply chains, whether they're created or whether we need to enhance them. Now, we need to keep and shift the focus from a cohesive and collaborative approach, both from the shops and from the engineering and administrative office environment. It's key that we make sure that the communication between all parties involved in an organization are on the same page. Otherwise, digitalization will not work. We need to have a hands-on approach meaning we need to train and we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Just like a company culture is very important to come from the senior leadership from the organization, digitalization transformation needs to come as well from the most senior level of an organization. Now collaboration between Canada and Indian as well definitely needs to have this most important aspect we need to clearly make sure that we're all on the same page and our goals and objectives to become digital are priority. Now, when I think of some examples in my experience, and I've had the great honor to work with some great uh, companies that are private and also um, some, com some OEM companies in the aerospace industry. And one common theme I've learned in working in these companies was the passion for enhancement, the passion for moving forward, the passion for finding ways to build upon the history and the legacy of the company. And digitization allows us to, to do just that. Now, an example I can share uh, th through my experiences in digitalization is in an operation, particularly in tool making, we all know that tool making is a vital aspect of any, any part, anything in the world. It does originate from a tool of some sort. 
Um, we had customers based in North America, uh, in, and we were working with some clients that were really looking to build up more business with us. Now, the problem is we were in one country and they were in another in North America. So there was some distance between us, but still we had to find opportunities to fulfill the customer's request to kind of be a little closer when it comes to a service oriented type of work. Now, we had a Canada operations. We had some operations just along the border in the United States and Mexico, and we had customers in Mexico. We wanted to enhance our Mexico operations, but maybe not just yet uh, come in there with a big amount of capitalized expenditure at the time. But we did need to speed up the process and fulfill our requests from our customer. So what I did was brought together a team of subject matter experts in the organization and really understood what is our value added from our location in the United States? What are our expertise and our experience in Canada? And how can we utilize both of these operations to fulfill needs of our customers based in Mexico? As soon as I looked at the shop floor and administration, I realized that we could collaborate and utilize these experiences we have amongst each other to come up with a new process, a new way of providing our service to the customer. What we did was we integrated digitalization in our operations, in our CAM and CAD and how we bring our products from the engineering to the shop. What we did was through some exercises in trial and error, we actually went through exercises to have in Canada digitalization take place. All the administrative duties to manufacture these tools was done in Canada. We utilized the United States to be a facility that was going to be doing the actual manufacturing. So what we have in place was we had Canada as the digital engineering CAM CAD, and we also had our partners, which are was a division of us in China as well, provide the services of digital CAD CAM. We would process all that work and we would send that over to our facility in the United States. Now, there were some key measures and disciplines that needed to take place. For example, we need to have control in Canada of these CNC machines and EDM machines that were in America. We need to have discipline in the operators to make sure that those tools and the tool holders with the cutters had the exact, exact cutters that we needed to be in those machines because our programmers were relying on those cutters to be in those machines because they were ultimately programming from a distance away. So there was some learning curves, there was some training, there was some cross training and some discipline that needed to take place. But all in all, we ended up utilizing this process and we reinvented how we were fulfilling our duties and our requests to, from our customers. What we did was this holistic new approach in building and designing tools, collaborating between our divisions in China, Canada, and USA to meet our requests from our Mexican customers was a very unique and very great exercise that we went through. It allowed us, it allowed us not only to build as an organization internally within our divisions, but we're also able to bring our product in over 40% less the time which our customer in turn was able to get their product sooner and was able to produce parts to their customer in that much less of a time. All in all, this was one example of a few that I can name that utilized the digitalization of how we operate, utilizing multi-facilities, multi-divisions to fulfill customers' requests. Now, there is tremendous opportunity in digitalization of the supply chain digitalization between Indian and Canadian companies. And I'll be more than happy to share more information and more ideas and stories about my experiences as well and how I think the collaboration between Canada and India will be one of very importance moving forward as the world moves to a digitalized, globalized supply chain. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all and I look forward to hearing from you if you indeed want to learn more about the opportunities that exist out there.
Thank you so much. All the best. Take care. Twenty-three years in automotive manufacturing taught us a lot. It taught us how to be on time and on budget. We got really good at continuous improvement. We we're incredibly efficient. So good that our products were on every continent except Antarctica. But in a global market for manufacturers, sometimes being good isn't good enough. It wasn't good enough for us when a supplier dropped out at the last minute. We couldn't source raw materials in our supply chain and we needed to keep a customer waiting. It wasn't good enough when we had an overseas customer who couldn't get their product because our freight carrier was unreliable, didn't do what they said. It wasn't good enough when we needed to innovate fast. But none of us was the right kind of engineer, so we didn't know what to look for and we hired the wrong person. The truth is that manufacturers are great at efficiency. We know process. We know how to improve it. We know how to build parts. But efficiency isn't enough to win in a global market. In our global market, we have more competition than we've ever had. We have competition for talent, just trying to get the right people, the really good ones. We have competition for customers, because anybody from anywhere in the world can market to our customers and take them. And with the supply chain as it is, we have competition for raw materials to make sure that we can produce what we need to next month. So prices rise, margins fall, and manufacturers are squeezed in the middle. The result is that we have questions that we need answered today. Questions like, how do we match inventory to production? How do we build an aftermarket parts department that takes our competitors' customers, turns them into our customers? How do we take a promising junior staff member on the shop floor and transition them from a team member to a team lead? These questions can't be solved with efficiency. They're about effectiveness. They're about knowing the answer so that we can do the right thing. And they were our questions. We needed to solve them. We think a lot of other manufacturers do too. And the answer lies in digitization. Digitization means access to anyone, anywhere in the world, at any time. My phone has more power than the computers that put man on the moon. And I need to use that access to information to answer the questions that we have as manufacturers. In fact, that's why we built this tool. We built a tool for manufacturers, starting with real experts, people with real dirt under their fingernails experience, the best production managers, maintenance managers, inventory people, aftermarkets, parts specialists and sales folk in the world for manufacturing businesses. And then we took them real problems, not a five-year plan, not a 10-year plan. We didn't bring them academic problems. We brought them problems that real manufacturing businesses are having today that are stopping them from growing, that are stopping them from getting new customers, that are hurting them and costing them money. And then we took those answers and we put them in real time frames because manufacturers can't send people away for training for five weeks. It's hard to take a key staff member off the floor for five hours to learn something. So we got our answers in five to 10 minutes so that you knew what to do next and you could move on to the next problem. Then we made the tool digital and you can see it here so that everybody on your team can have access to the answers they need anytime, anywhere. But Manufacturing Masters isn't for everybody. For manufacturers who want to do it the way they've always done it, this isn't the right platform. For manufacturers who think the only way forward is to make it cheaper, well, you should probably stop watching now because Manufacturing Masters isn't for you. Manufacturing Masters, though, it's the best tool in the world for manufacturers who are willing to do things differently, who want to learn best practice. It's the best tool in the world for manufacturers who want to open new markets and grow their margins. Manufacturing Masters was built with the answers for manufacturers who don't want to compete internationally. They just want to win internationally and they know what they need to get there. We're so confident that this can help real manufacturing businesses that we built a one month unlimited trial for everybody at DX. So jump in, bring your team in, find the answers to the questions that are stopping you from growing. If that's at all interesting to you, there's a link below. You just need to sign up. Welcome to the Red Canary booth at the DX Summit 3.0. We're excited that you decided to stop by and learn a bit more about us. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop your visitor's card 
talk to one of our representatives, or get in touch with us. Our contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. We were founded to address a gap in the market for highly technical, offensive, research-driven cybersecurity assessments. We do all the paper-based exercises like cybersecurity maturity, NIST and ISO compliance, threat and risk assessments. But it is our research and offensive security capabilities that really set us apart. The adversarial emulation services that we are engaged in include red teaming, purple teaming, network penetration testing, and application security testing. We're hackers, security researchers, trusted by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Canadian Industrial Security Directorate to work on sensitive, classified cybersecurity projects for key organizations across both the public and private sectors. We are also a part of Canada's Controlled Goods Program, which means we are cleared to work with Tier 1 and Tier 2 defense contractors. And in 2021, we became the first and only cybersecurity strategic partner of the International Air Transport Association, a trade association that represents over 290 airlines and over 80% of global air traffic. Our experts regularly present their research in the press and on the world stage at some of the biggest conferences in the industry, including DEF CON, Black Hat, and Sector, among others. The logos on this slide are just some of the places where our experts and their work have appeared. We work across a variety of sectors, including government, financial services and banking, aviation and aerospace, healthcare, energy, and defense. We also work with technology companies that require fully manual penetration testing to assess the cyber resilience of their fully customized and in-house developed applications. Our clients range from small technology companies that are scaling up, not-for-profits, government, all the way up to multinational corporations with mature cybersecurity programs. Our clients look to Red Canary and our experts to provide high quality cyber assurance. Our hackers are security researchers first and practitioners second. They deploy their research for our clients to innovate and replicate the tactics, techniques, and procedures of our clients' adversaries. Our experts respond to the most significant driving forces in the market today, including active threat actors, global technology adoption, and the COVID-19 pandemic, among many other areas. Our experts have developed open source cybersecurity tools that have been adopted all over the world. And our services range from adversarial emulation, governance risk and compliance, cloud security, and training programs. Several Red Canary clients rely on our experts to provide virtual chief information security officer and virtual chief technology officer to support their organizations at the C-suite level. Our clients choose us to strengthen their cyber resiliency for several critical reasons. At Red Canary, we are researchers first and practitioners second. Like the most dangerous cyber adversaries do, our experts at Cell at deploying their research to execute new and innovative attack vectors and by finding vulnerabilities in the most secure environments. While we perform a baseline automated scan, our adversarial emulation testing is nearly entirely manual. Our network or enterprise penetration tests include manual assessments of in-house developed applications or customized off-the-shelf commercial products. These applications require fully manual assessments as commercial scanners provide no coverage. While other firms may skip these applications in their assessments, our experts excel at providing our clients critical insight on these applications. Our team also includes senior resources with over 20 years experience and 30,000 hours of information security consulting work. Our clients expect the very best and we deliver senior security analysts on all of our engagements. This is one of the many ways that we set ourselves apart and build critical trust with our clients.
If you have any more questions, please feel free to stop by the booth, talk to one of our representatives, or leave your contact card with us. Alternatively, you can visit our website at www.redcanary.com or send us an email at intel at rc.ai. Thanks again for stopping by and we look forward to speaking with you. Hi, thanks for stopping by. I'm here to explain to you briefly how we at Acambo Technologies apply fault tolerance to achieve real-time cybersecurity and active safety in vehicles of any type, AV, EV, or otherwise. In a one sentence, we detect, correct, and heal in real time. So let's get into this. So what's the industry doing today to try and safeguard its vehicles? Well, there's an intrusion de detection technology of some type on the vehicle. And once it, it believes there is a uh, valid attack, it'll send up to the cloud, through the cloud to what's called a security operations center, which is a combination of people and technology, where they review and, and validate the attack. Once that's happened, it sends it over to the car company, the OEM, and their cyber team will determine the fix, policy, firmware, or otherwise. And then the fix will eventually work its way, wind its way back down to the vehicle. And this could take days, weeks, or even months. So this time frame may or may not be acceptable depending on the severity of whatever the attack was in the first place. So what's absent in this environment is a complete real-time in-vehicle solution for both cybersecurity and active safety. So this is the same vehicle, same attack, different result, however. So the attack is detected, corrected, and healed in real time in microseconds. It's the same vehicle, so it's still connected. However, the urgency, the immediacy of sending the information to the cloud is gone. Why? Because the, cloud, the vehicle is safe. So the information is sent up to the security operations center, um, does fleet analysis and other uh, analysis, packages it up into a useful uh, format for the car company, the OEM will work with its suppliers to try and design out whatever allowed this happen in the first place. So what are you looking at here? On the top right, you're looking at our demo system of what we call a four wheel steer by wire example. So if you look at, e there are four computers determining the steering angle of each of these wheels. Now it's important to note in four wheel steering, all four wheels turn to in as it's working properly to tighten the turning race uh, radius and to provide stability at speed so now we're going to attack this system with a cyber attack and as you can see the amount of, the uh, effect is immediate it's dramatic this vehicle is not drivable the occupants of this vehicle are in trouble now we're going to run the very same attack again on on the uh, bottom environment except we're going to have our software uh, working. So what you're going to do here is look in the middle and watch for a little uh, light indicator to come on. So we're going to run the attack. Here comes the light. It's safeguarding the system. The very same attack that caused the dramatic effect is causing no effect here. The vehicle is drivable. The occupants are perhaps unaware of this. However, we're aware and we can log and, and, and analyze the information. So how does this work? So what you're looking at here is a depiction, simplistic depiction of a car's network. So you see the circles, ECUs, these are computers on the system. There's a, a network connecting them all. Now in this environment, we have what we call a multiple authority, meaning more than one entity runs the same calculation. So in this particular example, we have service C running on ECU two, three, and five. And we also have a voting system that's available in the system, depicted here as a screen trapezoid available in all the, uh, all the major ECUs. And each one of these services runs its calculations and serves it into the voting system. And the voting system takes the information, analyzes the, the payload and determines three out of three, two out of three, a match, and it sends it on for additional analysis. Now, if it turns out that a threshold is hit that the, uh, the automotive designer has set, it says, you know what, we're gonna revoke authority from ECU2. And we're gonna move authority from ECU2 perhaps to ECU1 or perhaps to ECU4 and four wins. And 
ECU-4 will take over. And uh, so what have we just done? The vehicle is being driven. We have changed the architecture of the vehicle as it's being driven. This immediately causes a problem for the attacker because the very first thing an attacker needs to do is to learn the architecture before it can, it can take advantage of it. Now we could use to move F, A, and B as well and do a complete memory wipe and software reinstall, which is really the only true way to safeguard um, a system. So this is real time, low latency, works with encrypted traffic, multiple e ECUs could be reinstated or reflashed, works on single or multiple buses and we capture a log. So what are, the, what are the benefits of this in terms of cost? So you see in green below, this is our agent running on the ECUs, independent of which vendor supplies the ECUs. And so the cost savings are numerous. The first is we reduce the integration risk. The agent runs on the ECUs and it eliminates integration challenges and, and reduces race conditions, for example. There's less development effort. The automotive designers can focus primarily on user experience and functionality and not need to worry about security because our solution does the heavy lifting in terms of security. As I mentioned, there's a lower cost in the cloud because of the reduced urgency and reduced staffing. It also eliminates or uh, the dependency on a fix because of the uh, local healing we do. And it also reduces the security patches on a go forward basis. So to, to wrap up here, our solution addresses critical industry needs, including safety, reliability, and availability, as well as cybersecurity by applying fault tolerance. It reduces the need for an urgency of software updates, again, as a direct result of healing in vehicle. It reduces the cloud costs uh, and investments required. It simplifies the designer effort and minimizes the integration risk when there's multiple suppliers and multiple vendors providing the technology. And it also could choose to provide the OEM, the car company, the ability to feature upsells um, going forward. So thank you very much for listening. Um, please visit us at akimbotechnologies.com. We feel we are truly helping the industry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. If there are any more questions, then we will relay it to the companies and we will get back to you. Thank you so much for watching.